The new accelerator, H.G. Wells, certainly, if ever a man found a guinea when he was looking for a pin, it is my good friend Professor Gibbon. I have heard before of investigators overshooting the mark, but never quite to the extent that he has done. He has really, this time at any rate, without any touch of exaggeration in the phrase, found something to revolutionize human life. And that when he was simply seeking an all-round nervous stimulant to bring languid people up to the stresses of these pushful days. I have tasted the stuff now several times, and I cannot do better than describe the effect the thing had on me. That there are astonishing experiences in store for all in search of new sensations will become apparent enough. Professor Gibbon, as many people know, is my neighbor in Folkestone. Unless my memory plays me a trick, his portrait at various ages has already appeared in the Strand magazine think late in 1899 but I am unable to look it up because I have lent that volume to someone who has never sent it back. The reader may, perhaps, recall the high forehead and the singularly long black eyebrows that give such a Mephistophelian touch to his face. He occupies one of those pleasant little detached houses in the mixed style that make the western end of the upper Sandgate Road so interesting. His is the one with the Flemish gables and the Moorish portico, and it is in the little room with the mullioned bay window that he works when he is down here, and in which of an evening we have so often smoked and talked together. He is a mighty jester, but, besides, he likes to talk to me about his work, he is one of those men who find a help and stimulus in talking, and so I have been able to follow the conception of the new accelerator right up from a very early stage. Of course, the greater portion of his experimental work is not done in Folkestone, but in Gower Street, in the fine new laboratory next to the hospital that he has been the first to use. As everyone knows, or at least as all intelligent people know, the special department in which Gibbon has gained so great and deserved a reputation among physiologists is the action of drugs upon the nervous system. Upon soporifics, sedatives, and anesthetics he is, I am told, unequalled. He is also a chemist of considerable eminence and I suppose in the subtle and complex jungle of riddles that centers about the ganglion cell and the axis fiber her are little cleared places of his making, little glades of illumination, that, until he sees fit to publish his results, are still inaccessible to every other living man. And in the last few years he has been particularly assiduous upon this question of nervous stimulants, and already, before the discovery of the new accelerator, very successful with them. Medical science has to thank him for at least three distinct and absolutely safe invigorators of unrivaled value to practicing men. In cases of exhaustion the preparation known as Gibbon's B syrup has, I suppose, saved more lives already than any lifeboat round the coast, but none of these little things begin to satisfy me yet. He told me nearly a year ago. Either they increase the central energy without affecting the nerves or they simply increase the available energy by lowering the nervous conductivity, and all them are unequal and local in their operation. One wakes up the heart and viscera and leaves the brain stupefied, one gets at the brain champagne fashion, and does nothing good for the solar plexus, and what I want and what, if it's an earthly possibility, I mean to have is a stimulant that stimulates all round, that wakes you up for a time from the crown of your head to the tip of your great toe, and makes you go two or even three to everybody else's one. Eh? That's the thing I'm after, it would tire a man, I said, not to doubt of it. And you'd eat double or treble and all that. But just think what the thing would mean. Imagine yourself with a little file like this he held up a little bottle of green glass and marked his points with it and in this precious file is the power to think twice as fast, move twice as quickly, do twice as much work in a given time as you could otherwise do, but is such a thing possible, I believe so. If it isn't, I've wasted my time for a year. These various preparations of the hyperphosphites, for example, seem to show that something of the sort. Even if it was only one and a half times as fast it would do, it would do, I said, if you were a statesman in a corner, for example, time rushing up against you, something urgent to be done, eh, he could dose his private secretary, I said, and gain double time. And think if you, for example, wanted to finish a book, usually, I said, I wish I'd never begun M, or a doctor driven to death, wants to sit down and think out a case. Or a barrister or a man cramming for an examination, worth a guinea a drop, said I, and more to men like that, and in a duel, again, said Regibbon, where it all depends on your quickness in pulling the trigger, or in fencing, I echoed, you see, said Regibbon, if I get it as an all-round thing, it will really do you no harm at all except perhaps to an infinitesimal degree it brings you nearer old age. You will just have lived twice to other people's ones, I suppose, I meditated, in a duel it would be fair, that's a question for the seconds, said Regibbon, I harked back further. 
and you really think such a thing is possible? I said, as possible, said Rejibin, and glanced at something that went throbbing by the window, as a motor bus. As a matter of fact, he paused and smiled at me deeply, and tapped slowly on the edge of his desk with a green file. I think I know the stuff. Already I've got something coming. The nervous smile upon his face betrayed the gravity of his revelation. He rarely talked of his actual experimental work unless things were very near the end. And it may be, it may be I shouldn't be surprised it may even do the thing at a greater rate than twice, it will be rather a big thing, I hazarded, it will be, I think, rather a big thing, but I don't think he quite knew what a big thing it was to be, for all that, I remember we had several talks about the stuff after that. The new accelerator he called it and his tone about it grew more confident on each occasion. Sometimes he talked nervously of unexpected physiological results its use might have, and then he would get a little unhappy, at others he was frankly mercenary, and we debated long and anxiously how the preparation might be turned to commercial account. It's a good thing, said Rejibin, a tremendous thing. I know I'm giving the world something, and I think it only reasonable we should expect the world to pay. The dignity of science is all very well but I think somehow I must have the monopoly of the stuff for, say, ten years. I don't see why all the fun in life should go to the dealers in Han. My own interest in the coming drug certainly did not wane in the time. I have always had a queer little twist towards metaphysics in my mind. I have always been given to paradoxes about space and time, and it seemed to me that Jibin was really preparing no less than the absolute acceleration of life. Suppose a man repeatedly dosed with such a preparation. He would live an active and record life indeed but he would be an adult at eleven, middle-aged at twenty-five, and by thirty well on the road to senile decay. It seemed to me that so far Jibun was only going to do for anyone who took his drug exactly what nature has done for the Jews and Orientals, who are men in their teens and aged by fifty, and quicker in thought and act than we are all the time. The marvel of drugs has always been great to my mind, you can madden a man, calm a man, make him incredibly strong and alert or a helpless log, quicken this passion and allay that, all by means of drugs and here was a new miracle to be added to this strange armory of files the doctor's use. But Jibun was far too eager upon his technical points to enter very keenly into my aspect of the question. It was the 7th or 8th of August when he told me the distillation that would decide his failure or success for a time was going forward as we talked, and it was on the 10th that he told me the thing was done and the new accelerator a tangible reality in the world. I met him as I was going up the Sandgate Hill towards Folkestone I think I was going to get my hair cut and he came hurrying down to meet me I suppose he was coming to my house to tell me at once of his success. I remember that his eyes were unusually bright and his face flushed, and I noted even then the swift alacrity of his step, it's done, he cried, and gripped my hand, speaking very fast, it's more than done. Come up to my house and see, really, really? He shouted. Incredibly. Come up and see, and it does twice, it does more, much more. It scares me. Come up and see the stuff. Taste it. Try it. It's the most amazing stuff on earth. He gripped my arm and, walking at such a pace that he forced me into a trot, went shouting with me up the hill. A whole char -a bank full of people turned and stared at us in unison after the manner of people in Charsa Bank. It was one of those hot, clear days that Folkestone sees so much of, every color incredibly bright and every outline hard. There was a breeze, of course but not so much breeze as sufficed under these conditions to keep me cool and dry. I panted for mercy, I'm not walking fast, am I? cried Rejibin, and slackened his pace to a quick march, you've been taking some of this stuff, I puffed, no, he said. At the utmost a drop of water that stood in a beaker from which I had washed out the last traces of the stuff. I took some last night, you know. But that is ancient history now, and it goes twice? I said nearing his doorway in a grateful perspiration, it goes a thousand times, many thousand times, cried Rejibin, with a dramatic gesture, flinging open his early English carved oak gate, phew, said I, and followed him to the door, I don't know how many times it goes, he said, with his latchkey in his hand, and you, it throws all sorts of light on nervous physiology, it kicks the theory of vision into a perfectly new shape, heaven knows how many thousand times, We'll try all that after the thing is to try the stuff now, try the stuff? I said, as we went along the passage, rather, said Rejibin, turning on me in his study. There it is in that little green file there. Unless you happen to be afraid, I am a careful man by nature, and only theoretically adventurous. I was afraid. But on the other hand, there is pride, well, I haggled. 
You say you've tried it, I've tried it, he said, and I don't look hurt by it, do I? I don't even look livery, and I feel, I sat down. Give me the potion, I said. If the worst comes to the worst it will save having my hair cut, and that, I think, is one of the most hateful duties of a civilized man. How do you take the mixture, with water, said Rejibbon, whacking down a carafe, he stood up in front of his desk and regarded me in his easy chair, his manner was suddenly affected by a touch of the Harley Street specialist. It's rum stuff, you know, he said, I made a gesture with my hand, I must warn you, in the first place, as soon as you've got it down to shut your eyes, and open them very cautiously in a minute or so's time. One still sees. The sense of vision is a question of length of vibration, and not of multitude of impacts, but there's a kind of shock to the retina, a nasty giddy confusion just at the time if the eyes are open. Keep them shut, shut, I said. Good. And the next thing is, keep still. Don't begin to whack about. You may fetch something a nasty rap if you do. Remember you will be going several thousand times faster than you ever did before, heart, lungs, muscles, brain everything and you will hit hard without knowing it. You won't know it, you know. You'll feel just as you do now. Only everything in the world will seem to be going ever so many thousand times slower than it ever went before. That's what makes it so deuced queer, law, I said. And you mean, you'll see, said he, and took up a little measure. He glanced at the material on his desk. Glasses, he said, water. All here. Mustn't take too much for the first attempt, the little file glucked out its precious contents. Don't forget what I told you, he said, turning the contents of the measure into a glass in the manner of an Italian waiter measuring whiskey. Sit with the A's tightly shut and in absolute stillness for two minutes, he said. Then you will hear me speak. He added an inch or so of water to the little dose in each glass. By the by, he said, don't put your glass down. Keep it in your hand and rest your hand on your knee. Yes so. And now, he raised his glass. The new accelerator, I said. The new accelerator, he answered, and we touched glasses and drank, and instantly I closed my eyes, you know that blank non-existence into which one drops when one has taken gas. For an indefinite interval it was like that. Then I heard Jibbon telling me to wake up, and I stirred and opened my eyes. There he stood as he had been standing, glass still in hand. It was empty, that was all the difference, well? Said I, nothing out of the way, nothing. A slight feeling of exhilaration, perhaps. Nothing more, sounds, things are still, I said. By Jove. Yes. They are still. Except the sort of faint pat, patter, like rain falling on different things. What is it, analyzed sounds, I think he said, but I am not sure. He glanced at the window. Have you ever seen a curtain before a window fixed in that way before? I followed his eyes, and there was the end of the curtain, frozen, as it were, corner high, in the act of flapping briskly in the breeze. No said I, that's odd, and here, he said, and opened the hand that held the glass. Naturally I winced, expecting the glass to smash. But so far from smashing, it did not even seem to stir, it hung in mid-air motionless. Roughly speaking, said Rejibbon, an object in these latitudes falls sixteen feet in the first second. This glass is falling sixteen feet in a second now. Only, you see, it hasn't been falling yet for the hundredth part of a second. That gives you some idea of the pace of my accelerator, and he waved his hand round and round, over and under the slowly sinking glass. Finally he took it by the bottom, pulled it down and placed it very carefully on the table. Eh? He said to me, and laughed, that seems all right, I said, and began very gingerly to raise myself from my chair. I felt perfectly well, very light and comfortable, and quite confident in my mind. I was going fast all over. My heart, for example, was beating a thousand times a second, but that caused me no discomfort at all. I looked out of the window. An immovable cyclist, head down and with a frozen puff of dust behind his driving wheel, scorched to overtake a galloping char bank that did not stir. I gaped in amazement at this incredible spectacle. Jibbon, I cried, how long will this confounded stuff last, heaven knows. He answered. Last time I took it I went to bed and slept it off. I tell you, I was frightened. It must have lasted some minutes, I think it seemed like hours. But after a bit it slows down rather suddenly, I believe. I was proud to observe that I did not feel frightened I suppose because there were two of us. Why shouldn't we go out? I asked, why not, they'll see us, not they. Goodness, no. Why, 
We shall be going a thousand times faster than the quickest conjuring trick that was ever done. Come along. Which way shall we go? Window, or door, and out by the window we went. Assuredly of all the strange experiences that I have ever had, or imagined, or read of other people having or imagining, that little raid I made with Gibbon on the Folkestone Lees, under the influence of the new accelerator, was the strangest and muddest of all. We went out by his gate into the road, and there we made a minute examination of the statuesque passing traffic. The tops of the wheels and some of the legs of the horses of this chara bank, the end of the whiplash and the lower jaw of the conductor who was just beginning to yawn were perceptibly in motion, but all the rest of the lumbering conveyance seemed still, and quite noiseless except for a faint rattling that came from one man's throat. And as parts of this frozen edifice there were a driver, you know, and a conductor, and eleven people. The effect as we walked about the thing began by being madly queer and ended by being disagreeable. There they were, people like ourselves and yet not like ourselves, frozen in careless attitudes, caught in mid-gesture. A girl and a man smiled at one another, a leering smile that threatened to last forevermore, a woman in a floppy cap a line rested her arm on the rail and stared at Gibbon's house with the unwinking stare of eternity, a man stroked his moustache like a figure of wax and another stretched a tiresome stiff hand with extended fingers towards his loosened hat. We stared at them, we laughed at them, we made faces at them, and then a sort of disgust of them came upon us, and we turned away and walked round in front of the cyclist towards the lees, goodness! cried Rejibbon, suddenly, look there, he pointed, and there at the tip of his finger and sliding down the air with wings flapping slowly and at the speed of an exceptionally languid snail was a bee, and so we came out upon the lees. There the thing seemed madder than ever. The band was playing in the upper stand, though all the sound it made for us was a low-pitched, wheezy rattle, a sort of prolonged last sigh that passed at times into a sound like the slow, muffled ticking of some monstrous clock. Frozen people stood erect, strange, silent, self-conscious-looking dummies hung unstably in mid-stride, promenading upon the grass. I passed close to a little poodle dog suspended in the act of leaping, and watched the slow movement of his legs as he sank to earth. Lord, look here! cried Rejibbon, and we halted for a moment before a magnificent person in white faint striped flannels, white shoes, and a Panama hat, who turned back to wink at two gaily dressed ladies he had passed. A wink, studied with such leisurely deliberation as we could afford, is an unattractive thing. It loses any quality of alert gaiety, and one remarks that the winking eye does not completely close, that under its drooping lid appears the lower edge of an eyeball and a little line of white. Heaven give me memory, said I, and I will never wink again or smile, said Rejibbon, with his eye on a lady's answering teeth, it's infernally hot, somehow, said I, let's go slower, oh, come along, said Rejibbon, we picked our way among the bath chairs in the path. Many of the people sitting in the chairs seemed almost natural in their passive poses, but the contorted scarlet of the bandsman was not a restful thing to see. A purple-faced little gentleman was frozen in the midst of a violent struggle to refold his newspaper against the wind. There were many evidences that all these people in their sluggish way were exposed to a considerable breeze, a breeze that had no existence so far as our sensations went. We came out and walked a little way from the crowd, and turned and regarded it. To see all that multitude changed to a picture, smitten rigid, as it were, into the semblance of realistic wax, was impossibly wonderful. It was absurd, of course, but it filled me with an irrational, an exultant sense of superior advantage. Consider the wonder of it. All that I had said, and thought, and done since the stuff had begun to work in my veins had happened, so far as those people, so far as the world in general went, in the twinkling of an eye. The new accelerator I began, but Gibbon interrupted me, there's that infernal old woman. He said, what old woman, lives next door to me, said Rejibbon. As a lap dog that yaps. Gods. The temptation is strong, there is something very boyish and impulsive about Gibbon at times. Before I could expostulate with him he had dashed forward, snatched the unfortunate animal out of visible existence, and was running violently with it towards the cliff of the lees. It was most extraordinary. The little brute, you know, didn't bark or wriggle or make the slightest sign of vitality. It kept quite stiffly in an attitude of somnolent repose, and Gibbon held it by the neck. It was like running about with a dog of wood. Gibbon, I cried, put it down. Then I said something else. If you run like that, Gibbon, I cried you'll set your clothes on fire. Your linen trousers are going brown as it is, he clapped his hand on his thigh and stood hesitating on the verge. Gibbon, I cried, coming up, put it down. This heat is too much. It's our running so. 
two or three miles a second. Friction of the air, what? He said, glancing at the dog. Friction of the air, I shouted. Friction of the air. Going too fast. Like meteorites and things. Too hot. And, jibbon. Jibbon. I'm all over pricking and a sort of perspiration. You can see people stirring slightly. I believe the stuff's working off. Put that dog down, eh? He said, it's working off, I repeated. We're too hot and the stuff's working off. I'm wet through, he stared at me, then at the band. The wheezy rattle of whose performance was certainly going faster. Then with a tremendous sweep of the arm he hurled the dog away from him and it went spinning upward, still inanimate, and hung at last over the grouped parasols of a knot of chattering people. Gibbon was gripping my elbow. By Jove! He cried, I believe it is. A sort of hot pricking and yes. That man's moving his pocket handkerchief. Perceptibly. We must get out of this sharp. But we could not get out of it sharply enough. Luckily, perhaps. For we might have run, and if we had run we should, I believe, have burst into flames. Almost certainly we should have burst into flames. You know we had neither of us thought of that. But before we could even begin to run the action of the drug had ceased. It was the business of a minute fraction of a second. The effect of the new accelerator passed like the drawing of a curtain, vanished in the movement of a hand. I heard Gibbon's voice in infinite alarm. Sit down, he said, and flop down upon the turf at the edge of the lees I sat scorching as I sat. There is a patch of burnt grass there still where I sat down. The whole stagnation seemed to wake up as I did so, the disarticulated vibration of the band rushed together into a blast of music, the promenaders put their feet down and walked their ways. The papers and flags began flapping, smiles passed into words. The winker finished his wink and went on his way complacently, and all the seated people moved and spoke, the whole world had come alive again was going as fast as we were, or rather we were going no faster than the rest of the world. It was like slowing down as one comes into a railway station. Everything seemed to spin round for a second or two, I had the most transient feeling of nausea, and that was all. And the little dog, which had seemed to hang for a moment when the force of Gibbon's arm was expended, fell with a swift acceleration clean through a lady's parasol. That was the saving of us. Unless it was for one corpulent old gentleman in a bath chair who certainly did start at the sight of us, and afterwards regarded us at intervals with a darkly suspicious sigh, and, finally, I believe, said something to his nurse about us, I doubt if a solitary person remarked our sudden appearance among them. Plop. We must have appeared abruptly. We ceased to smolder almost at once, though the turf beneath me was uncomfortably hot. The attention of everyone including even the Amusements Association band, which on this occasion, for the only time in its history, got out of tune was arrested by the amazing fact, and the still more amazing yapping and uproar caused by the fact, that a respectable, overfed lap dog sleeping quietly to the east of the bandstand should suddenly fall through the parasol of a lady on the west in a slightly singed condition due to the extreme velocity of its movements through the air. In these absurd days, too, when we are all trying to be as psychic, and silly, and superstitious as possible. People got up and trod on other people, chairs were overturned, the Lee's policemen ran. How the matter settled itself I do not know we were much too anxious to disentangle ourselves from the affair and get out of range of the eye of the old gentleman in the bath chair to make minute inquiries. As soon as we were sufficiently cool and sufficiently recovered from our giddiness and nausea and confusion of mind to do so we stood up, and skirting the crowd, directed our steps back along the road below the metropole towards Gibbon's house. But amidst the din I heard very distinctly the gentleman who had been sitting beside the lady of the ruptured sunshade using quite unjustifiable threats and languages to one of those chair attendants who have inspector written on their caps, if you didn't throw the dog, he said, who did, the sudden return of movement and familiar noises, and our natural anxiety about ourselves, our clothes were still dreadfully hot, and the fronts of the thighs of Gibbon's white trousers were scorched to drabish brown, prevented the minute observations I should have liked to make on all these things. Indeed, I really made no observations of any scientific value on that return. The bee, of course, had gone. I looked for that cyclist, but he was already out of sight as we came into the upper Sandgate Road or hidden from us by traffic, the Chara Bank, however, with its people now all alive and stirring, was clattering along at a spanking pace almost abreast of the nearer church, we noted, however, that the window sill on which we had stepped in getting out of the house was slightly singed and that the impressions of our feet on the gravel of the path were unusually deep, so it was I had my first experience of the new accelerator. 
Practically we had been running about and saying and doing all sorts of things in the space of a second or so of time. We had lived half an hour while the band had played, perhaps, two bars. But the effect it had upon us was that the whole world had stopped for our convenient inspection. Considering all things, and particularly considering our rashness in venturing out of the house, the experience might certainly have been much more disagreeable than it was. It showed, no doubt, that Gibbon has still much to learn before his preparation is a manageable convenience, but its practicability it certainly demonstrated beyond all cavil. Since that adventure he has been steadily bringing its use under control, and I have several times, and without the slightest bad result, taken measured doses under his direction, though I must confess, I have not yet ventured abroad again while under its influence. I may mention, for example, that this story has been written at one sitting and without interruption, except for the nibbling of some chocolate, by its means. I began at 6.25, and my watch is now very nearly at the minute past the half hour. The convenience of securing a long, uninterrupted spell of work in the midst of a day full of engagements cannot be exaggerated. Gibbon is now working at the quantitative handling of his preparation, with a special reference to its distinctive effects upon different types of constitution. He then hopes to find a retarder, with which to dilute its present rather excessive potency. The retarder will, of course, have the reverse effect to the accelerator, used alone it should enable the patient to spread a few seconds over many hours of ordinary time, and so to maintain an apathetic inaction, a glacial-like absence of alacrity, amidst the most animated or irritating surroundings. The two things together must necessarily work an entire revolution in civilized existence. It is the beginning of our escape from that time garment of which Carlyle speaks. While this accelerator will enable us to concentrate ourselves with tremendous impact upon any moment or occasion that demands our utmost sense and vigor, the retarder will enable us to pass in passive tranquility through infinite hardship and tedium. Perhaps I am a little optimistic about the retarder, which has indeed still to be discovered, but about the accelerator there is no possible sort of doubt whatever. Its appearance upon the market in a convenient, controllable, and assimilable form is a matter of the next few months. It will be obtainable of all chemists and druggists, in small green bottles, at a high but, considering its extraordinary qualities, by no means excessive price. Gibbon's nervous accelerator it will be called, and he hopes to be able to supply it in three strengths, one in two hundred, one in nine hundred, and one in two thousand, distinguished by yellow, pink, and white labels respectively, no doubt its use renders a great number of very extraordinary things possible, for, of course, the most remarkable and, possibly, even criminal proceedings may be effected with impunity by thus dodging, as it were, into the interstices of time. Like all potent preparations, it will be liable to abuse. We have, however, discussed this aspect of the question very thoroughly, and we have decided that this is purely a matter of medical jurisprudence and altogether outside our province. We shall manufacture and sell the accelerator, and as for the consequences we shall see.